Hello again everyone and welcome back to the underground. Today we're going to introduce the topic of how to send encrypted messages from one person to another. This is obviously a very large topic and could take years to cover, however we're going to start simple with the one-time pad. So what is a one-time pad? In short, a one-time pad is a way of encrypting messages so that they cannot be decrypted except by the person receiving the message. It is one of the most secure ways to encrypt a message because mathematically, the one-time pad is impossible to break. So how does it work? Well, much like every other encrypted form of sending messages, this way is pretty simple. Let's say a spy station wants to send a message to their agents out in the field. So what they do is they get their message, they encrypt it using the one-time pad, they then transmit it using a sh usually a shortwave radio, where the recipient turns on their shortwave radio and receives the message. They then decrypt the message and we're done, the communication is complete. In this example, this is a one-way communication, i.e. one person transmitting and another person receiving, but the one-time pad most certainly is capable and is frequently used in two-way communication as in two people exchanging encrypted messages back and forth. This is of course an oversimplified explanation of how the whole thing works, but that's the beauty of it. It's simple. So let's dig into the meat and potatoes of what you actually need to make a one-time pad. The first thing you need to get started with a one-time pad message is a friend. That's right, you need someone to send the message to. A trusted individual who you're going to be sure is going to keep their, uh, their stuff secure on their end, and you're going to keep your stuff secure on your end so that you can have communication securely between the two of you. The next thing you need is obviously a message, something to say, something of importance that warrants using a one-time pad. This is not as simple as picking up your cell phone and texting someone. This is going to be for communication that you need to be absolutely secure, again, between two people. You also need a conversion table to convert normal letters to numbers. You also need, obviously, your one-time pad. You need something to write with. Usually the most common form for people using one-time pads is just a simple piece of paper and a pencil. And if you wanted to go the extra mile, you would also need a code book, which I think is extremely, extremely vital. Although technically for the one-time pad process, you do not need one, but we'll talk more about that in just a second. And then also, if you're wanting to generate your one-time pad, you will also need at least five 10-sided dice. So speaking of the one-time pad, what exactly is this? Well, the one-time pad itself is really simple. All it is is randomized numbers in groups of five characters. Usually it looks something like this. Now, the very important part about a one-time pad is that these numbers are truly randomized, not pseudo-random, meaning, meaning that you typing numbers out on your keyboard, that, that's not going to be random, that is pseudo-random. Believe it or not, human beings are not particularly original when it comes to picking numbers randomly, so people tend to usually have lots of patterns develop when they're trying to pick numbers randomly. That's where the 10-sided dice come in. And though this is kind of an old school way of doing things, using five or, or as many as you want, 10-sided uh, dice, uh, so that you can throw them out on a table somewhere and then get five numbers at random to start building this table. That's how the whole thing is made. But we'll talk more about that at the end. Another critical part of a one-time pad that I wanted to mention now, but again, we'll mention at the end, is to never store this on a computerized device. Nothing that takes a battery, nothing that plugs into any kind of electronic device whatsoever. And again, be very, very cautious in using computerized random number generators. There are plenty of, of software packages and platforms out on the internet that will tell you that they can uh, generate uh, one-time pads for you. You just Google one-time pad generator and you'll find five or six right off the bat. Uh, this is not preferred for extreme, extreme security. And as we get, as we'll get to it at the end, this can present a lot of vulnerabilities that you might not know about until it's too late. But just for brevity and expediency, this one-time pad, which we will continue to use today, was generated using an online one-time pad generator. Up next is the conversion chart. Now this seems like it's quite simple, but there is a lot of math that actually goes into this. A conversion table is simply a table that converts letters to numbers. That's all it is. However, there is a method to the madness. Technically, a conversion table could be completely randomized, meaning you completely randomly assign numbers to letters using either your dice or some other method. Uh, you could do that if you want. However, 
that's not really necessary. This entire table does not have to be secure. It does not have to be hidden away. You could uh, print it out and keep it with you laminated at all times. It's not really necessary to keep this secure. And this particular table you'll find oftentimes rotating around the internet from various sources. I'm sorry I don't know exactly who came up with this particular table. My guess is it probably goes back to the original days of the Cold War or post-World War II when uh, one-time pads really came into uh, very common use with spy agencies. Uh, but in any case, this particular table has been engineered from the ground up to be extremely, extremely efficient and also make it easier to detect errors. So again, we'll come back to this at the end because once we go through a couple of examples, you'll see why this particular table is very, very handy to have. And finally, a code book is very handy to have with this process. It saves you a lot of time and it conserves a lot of your one-time pad resources. This will make a lot of sense as we start going through this through the examples. A codebook is nothing more than a book of common words and phrases that are condensed into numbers. This conserves the one-time pad, which makes it last longer. If you're using a radio to transmit these messages, it makes it a lot easier and a lot shorter and a lot quicker to transmit three characters instead of the entire operation word, right? And finally, using a codebook adds in yet another layer of complexity to an already complex system, right? So if someone is able to actually decrypt your one-time pad message, either you get compromised or you're, the person you're communicating with gets compromised or one of you gets sloppy and makes a mistake somewhere, even if your adversarial force is able to decrypt your one-time pad message, they're still going to have to have the codebook to know what you're talking about. This will make a lot of sense as we start composing our message, which is the first step. Obviously, the very first step in encoding a message is to write the message. So for today's example, we're going to write the message, mission begins at dawn, period, travel to coordinates, colon, 30 uniform, x-ray charlie, 5510-6318, period. That's going to be the message that we're going to send to our person that we're trying to communicate to. The first step in the encryption process is to convert that message to numbers using our conversion table. And as we can see, this is where our codebook is already starting to get really, really helpful because we've got a lot of long words here that we can use our codebook to help us shorten down quite a bit. So for instance, the word mission, if we were to write that without the codebook, it would look like the numbers 79, 3, 83, 83, 3, Five, four. That's the word mission converted using our conversion table. Now, if we were to just to go to our code book, we could clearly see that the word that the code in our code book for mission, the word mission, is 078. So it saves us quite a bit of effort and quite a bit of decoding. And again, it makes it harder for someone to understand if they don't have the code book. If someone were able to decrypt this message, they would just simply get the numbers 078 instead of the word mission spelled out for them. So we can convert the rest of the message using our conversion table, including things like punctuation and spaces. Now, some of you might notice at the bottom of the conversion table, there are a couple of duplicates. As we can see, the, uh, the key, the, the terminology for space is the number 99. Well, 99 is also the <laughs> way that you delineate the number 9. This can get a little confusing at some sometimes. That's why it's not a really good idea to have duplicates. However, this works in this case because we can clearly see nines are very easy to see with the eye, and you can clearly see when someone's trying to communicate a space versus the letter nine. It's all about context, right? So if you have to reuse some numbers uh, for common letters, as uh, happens with other cryptographic methods, that's okay. Just make sure that the context remains the same. For those of you who are wondering, where did this terminology come from? Where did the, the, the practice of using double digits to delineate a number, where did that come from? Well, it came from the Stasi. That's right, the East German secret police who used this method exclusively. In fact, here's a conversion table that was used by the East German secret police, the Stasi, during the Cold War to communicate with their agents in Western Europe. This is what they used, and as you can clearly see, they preferred using double digits to delineate numbers. This makes it a lot more secure because the Americans at the time, at least some sources claim, that the Americans at the time and other Western powers used triplicate. So they would use triple uh, the number. So if you were trying to write the letter 1, it would be 111. 
or two would be two, 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 and so on. These Germans were very cognizant that a triplicate would develop a pattern, so they kept it as two digits. So one, the number one, became one, one. And as we can see, when we're trying to convert our coordinates, it's simply doubled up just for ease of use and to make sure that it's as secure as possible and it conserves numbers and letters on your uh, one-time pad as well. So hopefully this isn't too confusing so far. So far, all we have done is written our message and converted that message to numbers using our conversion table and, if possible, our codebook. And if we were to use a codebook, we can clearly see the string of text along the bottom there. That is our fully uh, converted message. It's still not encrypted yet. That's the next step. Uh, but this is what we need to start using our one-time pad. So the next step is to stay organized and arrange the numbers in groups of five characters. This is very important for pretty much any cryptographic method. This is very common to basically group all of these numbers together, right? So as we can see here, I've done it very, very clearly so that everyone can see exactly how this is done. All you're doing is squishing all the numbers together and then separating them into groups of five. So instead of having 078 space 99, it becomes 07899 space 04599 space and so on. It is always a good idea to stay as organized as physically possible when trying to deal with any kind of code breaking or cryptographic communication, right? The slightest error can mean that your entire message gets basically turned into gibberish, and we don't want that. So once we have our groups of five letters, what I'm going to do just for ex the example I'm, I'm showing you today, we're going to convert that font to Courier New, right? I know nobody really likes talking about fonts, but this is very important that we'll, we'll talk about later. But just know that I'm switching it to Courier New so that we can easily have a nice grid of numbers. And to make things a little bit easier to show on the slide, I'm simply going to arrange them in columns of three groups of five letters. That makes a nice little square rectangular box that's easy for us to look at. So that's all I've done is just squished everything together and made it really nice and easy to understand. And now we can begin to encrypt our message. Next, we bring in our one-time pad and get to work. So what I'm going to do, again, is take our yellow block of text over here on the left. Remember, that is just our simple, plain text, unencrypted message that's just converted to numbers using the conversion table, right? I'm going to spread that out a bit so that we can have some room to work because we're going to have to do this number by number, letter by letter, line by line. And this will make a lot of sense as we start putting this stuff together. So once we spread our message out so that we can easily and clearly see what we're doing, we can now begin to encrypt the message. And the first thing that we need to do is take our one-time pad and select a random five-number group. In this case, I'm just going to randomly put my finger on the number group 92046. Doesn't matter where it is on the page, it could be anywhere, but I'm just going to randomly pick that one. That's going to tell the recipient where to start using their pad. This is very, very important. And this is kind of like a, hey, start over here message, right? It doesn't need to be uh, encrypted of any kind. It's just a, hey, start here in your one-time pad uh, book. So what we're going to do is keep that in mind and we're going to put it in front of our message. That's sort of like the message prefix. Really what it's called is the key indicator. It indicates which key we are using. Without the key indicator, it is going to be impossible to find out where to start on the one-time pad. Once you have your key indicator all figured out, then you can start copying down the numbers that come after that directly underneath your plain text message just like I've done here. As you can see, I took the numbers 06744 and put them directly underneath 07899, the first few numbers in our message. We continue this all the way down, using up as much of our one-time pad as we need to get the message across. We can start seeing here the downsides of the one-time pad because you need to have a one-time pad that is long enough to send your entire message. Again, highlighting the importance of a codebook to keep things as short as possible. Once we've done this, we can now encrypt our message. So we can take our one-time pad and get it out of the way. We don't need it anymore because we've already copied it down to our worksheet here. The first step is, of course, to move down our key indicator. So 92046, in this case, just moves down and it becomes the first part of our message. 
Next, we go number by number and subtract the bottom number from the top number. So we'll go through each one of these until the entire sheet is done. For the first ones there, we can clearly see that 0 minus 0 is 0. The next number set is 7 minus 6 is 1. Very clearly, right? So far, so good. 8 minus 7 is 1. 9 minus 4 is 5. Again, 9 minus 4 is 5. 0 minus 0 is 0, 4 minus 2 is 2, but ah, here, now we come to this group of numbers here. 5 minus 7 is a negative number, is it not? So what we're going to have to do is, in, in a case like this where the top number is smaller than the bottom number, we're simply going to add a little imaginary 1 in front of that number. So 5 becomes 15, and 15 minus 7 is 8. And we continue this throughout the entire message, doing this all the way down to the very end. So just to keep everyone on the same page, let's recap. The red text on your screen, in this case the numbers 92046, that's our key indicator. It has nothing to do with the message, it's not a conversion of anything, it's just to let us know, or let the recipient know, where to start in the book. The yellow text on your screen is, of course, our plain text message. It is unencrypted. The only thing that that is, is letters converted to numbers using our conversion table. That's all that is. Our purple text, well, that's our one-time pad. Those are the numbers that come after our key indicator in our one-time pad. So if, as we read our one-time pad, we should see 92046-06744, and so on, all the way down, just like I showed you. And our white text at the bottom of that, that's the result of our simple math, our simple subtraction, to get what is now our encrypted message. So we're actually done. Our message is now encrypted. And as you can see on the left-hand side of your screen, now in all white text, that is our final message. This message has now been encrypted using the one-time pad that is on the right-hand side of your screen. Now the final step for the person encrypting the message is to strike out the, no the parts of the one-time pad that they used. This is absolutely mandatory. It is one of the most crucial steps in this entire thing. Whatever you use, take a pencil and one line strike through all of the number groups that you used. If you only used like part of a group, like if your message was slightly short and you didn't end up having a perfect group of five, that's okay. Just go ahead and strike through the rest of that um, five number group. It just makes it a little bit easier uh, for the person to find where to start next time. So there we go. The sender of the message is done. This message has now been encrypted and is now ready to send. Now before we send this message, we have a couple of things that we can do. When it comes to transmitting these kinds of messages, which are usually done via shortwave radio, historically that's what's been used by spy agencies, uh, there's a lot of different things that are done. Uh, usually the first thing that's done is to, in front of the entire message, add in a call sign. Usually it can be any kind of thing. It can be actual letters, it can be numbers. Uh, in many cases, it's simply just a three or another five number combination. That's the call sign. So, so someone who is sitting in their headquarters, they're waiting desperately for the next message to come from their units in the field or vice versa. If someone's out in the field waiting for the next message from their headquarters, uh, they can sit there and listen for their call sign. They can ignore every other message that comes over that frequency. But when they hear, in this case, the call sign is 056. When they hear those numbers, they know to pick up their pencil and start copying down. So in that case, it's very helpful for making sure that a person has enough time to get ready to copy the message. You don't want to start off by just transmitting 92046 because a person might not be ready. They might not be ready to copy down the message. They might be indisposed or, or, or something else. Uh, you want to make sure that they have just a few seconds to get ready and to pay very close attention because if you get one of these numbers wrong or slightly out of sequence, the message is not going to be readable. Over the years, some spy agencies have also also been known to triple each number group too. So in, in this case, uh, you would hear the transmission of 056, usually repeated three times, and then you would hear each num each group of five numbers repeated three times as well. So you would hear over the radio 92046, 92046, 92046. Then they would move on to the next one, 01155, 01155, 01155, 
and so on and so forth until the whole message has been completed. Since one-time pads are mostly used over shortwave radio for spy agencies, it makes it a lot easier for people to understand if they're in the middle of a, you know, it's in the middle of the night, they're in some kind of public location, they're, they can't quite hear it very well. This makes it a lot easier and just in case they miss a digit. They don't have to go back to the whole message, uh, to, very, to the very front of the message. They can just listen for the next group of five letters, or sorry, five numbers, and they will be able to get uh, that number that they missed. Makes it a lot easier, especially under harsh conditions. So the message has been sent and the recipient has got it and now what do we do? How do we decrypt the message? Well, it's very, very simple and it's basically the reverse of what we did to encrypt it. So the very first step is to gather the materials together. You're going to need the numbers that you heard, either transmitted over a radio or handed to you on a slip of paper or found in a dead drop. However, whatever transmission or handoff method is used, you need that message. You need those numbers, right? You also need your one-time pad. That's the minimum you need to get this started, right? You just need the one-time pad and the message. You also need your conversion table if you haven't memorized it already or, you know, if you're not using one that's this kind Kind of standardized, uh, you're going to need whatever number table or whatever conversion table you're using, and you're also going to need your code book, again, if you choose to use one. So to decrypt the message, the very first step is to find the key indicator. As we can see here, our very first string of five numbers in the message is 92046. That triggers the person, the recipient, to go flip through their one-time pad and find the numbers 92046, which they did, as you can see here. So there we go. We found it. It's marked there in red. 92046 is our key indicator. Once we found our key indicator, what we need to do is, again, copy down the one-time pad, the, the numbers on the one-time pad, directly underneath our message, just like we did before in reverse. You can probably see where this is going, right? So once we've kept everything nice and neat, we've we've kind of put our uh, key indicator off to the side because we know that was not really used for anything but to let us know where to start, right? We push that off to the side and we start copying down our numbers. Once we do that, the next step is quite simple and we just start adding them together. So zero plus zero becomes zero. Six plus one becomes seven. Seven plus one becomes eight. Five plus four equals nine. Five plus four equals nine again, and so on and so forth. If there is a number that becomes greater than 10, we simply leave that one, uh, we leave that first digit off and we use just the last digit, right? So as we can see, just a little bit of a ways down there, we have five plus seven. Well, five plus seven does not equal two, it equals 12, but we leave the one off from the 12 so that we keep all of our digits nice and straight. And there we go. Now we have our decrypted text in yellow. Again, the final step before moving on to using our conversion table is to strike out the one-time pad. This is very, very important. Everyone must strike out exactly the same portions from their one-time pad. Both the transmitter and the receiver must have identical one-time pads. They must have exactly the same sections crossed out. And as we can see here, if we have incredibly efficient communication between two people, you should be able to pull both of their pads and look at their one-time pads together and they should have exactly the same sections crossed out. If they don't have the same sections crossed out, something has gone very, very wrong, and we will talk about that at the end. The next step is to use our conversion table to convert that plain text into plain English. As we can see here, we get the message 078 space 045 space dawn period 117 space 2 space 061 colon 30 uniform x-ray charlie 55106318 period now we use our code book to finally decrypt this message fully we can exchange those numbers from our code book for actual words and terminology in this case the message becomes mission begins at dawn period travel to coordinates colon 30 uniform x-ray charlie 55106318 period so there we go, we've completely decrypted the message and completed this communication. So before we go on, let's go ahead and try to do another one here. Uh, I've made up another practice example using the same one-time pad as before. So here is everything you need to decrypt this message. You have your one-time pad, again, that's already been used, right? Because we're not go we're going to keep this as realistic as possible. So this one-time pad has been used, but that's okay, because we're going to use some other parts of it. So 
There's the one time pad. There's your encrypted message on the left, your conversion table, and your code book. So you can now pause the video to try to decrypt this for yourself and see if your answer lines up with what we've got here. So here is my work in decrypting uh, the, my own message that I uh, put together there. As you can see, the last group of characters uh, was not used fully. As you can see here on our one-time pad, we used the number group 443, but the 2-1 on the end of that number group we didn't use. Technically, you could use it. Uh, again for a different message, but we're not going to because this makes it a lot easier for uh, the next person to uh, find the next message. So they're not going to be looking for just two one. You know, they're going to be looking for six seven two seven six, uh, as you can see in the the one time pad uh, that's that's up next. So just wanted to kind of clarify that. That again, if you're going to be using just part, just even just one number from a five uh, number group, that's okay, but it's usually a best practice to, if you use the part of a five letter group, just strike through the whole group and just dispose of it. You're not going to be using that again, even if you did not use uh, some of those numbers. And again, at the bottom there in the gray box is the plain text message that you can then use uh, your conversion table to start decrypting, right? And in this case, you see I used quite a lot of words from the code book. So we have 165 space 167 space 078 space 128, period. That's just a, that's a whole sentence using just the code book. That's why having a code book is so important because you can get away with some, some pretty complex ideas using still basically encoded language, right? If we follow the rest of the message and we use our code book, we can determine that the message does in fact read, unable to verify mission success, period, need new code book, period. So that was the message. Now to address a, a few questions that I know are going to pop up because when I started using one-time pads you know, you know, a few years ago or so, I started noticing that I was having a, a few problems or a few difficulties. So let's go ahead and take this group of, of uh, numbers here and let's talk about them separately. So as we can see, this group of numbers delineates the word need and then a space behind it, right? Now, how do I know that four equals N and two equals E? How do I know it's four space two and not 42? So in other words, why is this message broken out like this? How did I do that? And why is it not something like 42, 27, 29, 9, right? How do I know where to break out each letter? Well, that's very, very simple. And it's very, very ingenious. And it goes back to our conversion table. This is why you pick a conversion table like this one. Because mathematically, as we can see, the reason that this message gets broken out like this is because there is no 42 on this conversion table. There is no 27 and there is no 29. The numbers have to be four because four means N. There is no other number that, that, that matches up, right? Two has to be E, another two has to be E. So we know that it's not 22 because there is no 22 on the conversion table. That's why if you can choose your conversion table wisely or just copy the one I have here, which you can do if you want, this makes it so that it is error detecting. It allows you to more easily detect if you have made a mistake. So when you're tired, it's in the middle of the night, you've had a long day, you've got to get a communique in or something like that, you can still make sure that you don't make any mistakes because the conversion table will not let you substitute incorrect letters. And that's why the numbers are set up the way they are. So I just wanted to point that out because this is something that doesn't get really talked about when it comes to one-time pads, and it is something that you will come upon if you try to start doing this for yourself. So now that we understand how the one-time pad works and some little quirks and tips to kind of make it work a little bit better and more efficiently, let's talk about security. More specifically, the best practices you can take to make sure that your communications are truly unbreakable. Obviously, one of the very first and most widely touted security practices of the one-time pad is to never use it more than once. It's called a one-time pad for a reason. After sending a message, spies would strike through the, the characters that they used and just tear that out of their book, tear out the whole page of that book in most cases, and just kind of dispose all of the randomized numbers that they didn't use. That's inefficient, uh, so if you're trying to keep a one-time pad and use it as many Many times as possible, it's probably not the best to kind of throw <laughs> throughout the entire unused, an entire unused sheet, especially if you're just sending one or two words. You don't want to 
throw away your whole sheet, right? But it's, it's a good practice to make sure that you never use a one-time pad twice. Now, this might seem very easy. You might say, oh, okay, cool, I won't use it twice. Well, here's, here's how this can get really, really complicated. So let's bring back our one-time pad example that we've already used with our uh, explanation and the little practice example that I gave you. So here's a one-time pad that has already been used. Now, let's say that, as you can see, the 92046 uh, section, that message, uh, has been received by both parties, and both parties, both people who own each one-time pad, have stricken that through, right? So that's all good to go. That's that's fantastic. That's a, a perfectly fine and good example of how to do this. Now let's just say, for instance, that the person on the left is going to send the practice message that I created, right? Uh, that 39342 message. And let's just say, for instance, that the second person, the person on the right-hand side of your screen, did not get that message. Let's just say it, it was transmitted at, a wrong, at the wrong time of day, or they weren't able to make it to their particular particular comm window, and they didn't get that message. Well, if they were to send another message themselves, and starting with, as we can see right here, 10933 to the first person, they're going to overlap. They're going to overlap and use up uh, parts of their one-time pad that, that the first person used and the second person did not know they used, right? Because they never got the message. This is why it is absolutely crucial to make sure that everyone gets the message because that little overlap, those that overlap starting with 39342 uh, and then going all the way down to 46792, that overlap that is enough to decrypt this ent this entire one-time pad, right? That is enough to um, maybe not compromise the first message, but it's definitely enough to compromise the second message. That's the problem with one-time pads is that you say, all right, don't use it twice, but it's a little bit more complicated than that in real-world use. That's why you absolutely must make certain that the other person is getting your message and is striking out from their one-time pad those parts of the message, right? And this gets even more complicated with the next security tip, which is to always destroy the one-time pad after each use. Like I mentioned, most spies over history have just torn out that page from their one-time pad and disposed of it after they send their message. And that's all well and good, um, but the reason that you have a lot of spies uh, get caught is because they did not destroy their one-time pad, and that one-time pad came into the possession of their adversary, right? They got caught with uh, a notebook with their one-time pad written in it, right? That's a huge problem because once you destroy your one-time pad, you can't confirm that you didn't make a mistake. You cannot confirm that the other person has the same part of their book scratched out. You, you can't really confirm anything. You just kind of have to send it and just let it go, right? So that's kind of one of the frustrating uses is that you might be tempted to save your one-time pad to make sure that the other person got your message and you're going to wait for their reply before you uh, send out the next message so that you can make sure that you actually both have the same parts of your book uh, marked out. This is a really bad security practice. You don't need to do this. And it's much, much better to have to resend a message with a completely new sheet of paper or a completely new one-time pad uh, than it is to try to fix a mistake you made. Right, so if the person cannot decrypt your message, it's better to make sure that you just completely start from scratch, ch choose a different part of your one-time pad, and start over. That's the best security practice you can do. And when it comes to other security practices, stuff that makes a lot of sense, right? If a one-time pad or, or even your codebook is outside of your control, assume that both have been compromised, right? One-time pads, again, they only work if physical security is 100% guaranteed. This is not easy to do. Um, I would argue that it is easier to do in today's age of technology where roughly 99.9999% of communications are over completely open and crackable or surveilled networks, right? So someone walking around with a one-time pad in your pocket in today's society is a lot more secure than walking around with some kind of encrypted um, digital communication device, right? That is, that is intercepted and most likely surveilled, right? But with physical 
physical security comes a lot of responsibility, meaning if you get compromised, if you get grabbed or something like that before you can destroy your one-time pad or your codebook, you had better make sure that you can destroy it. Um, and if you can't, your person who you're communicating with must also uh, be very wary of your compromise. And that leads to the final point, which is do not reply to questionable messages. The interesting thing about spies talking to one another or spies talking to their handlers or to their case officers or, or whoever is that they get to know the people that are in their world. And if the person that you're communicating with uses non-standard language or, or phrasing that you're not familiar with or it just doesn't quite sound like it's the person you're talking to. And even then, if you know that you're talking to the right person, if you know that you're talking to your either your source or your case officer or your handler or, or another uh, person around the globe, and they're talking and they're, they're speaking using terminology and phrases that make it sound like someone else is listening into the conversation, uh, that's a huge clue that they might have been compromised, right? So when it comes to adding on layers of security, we can do something else uh, to make sure that these messages are in fact being sent genuinely and not under duress conditions. So let's specifically talk about challenge codes or duress codes. Uh, so this is only done sometimes, but I think that it's a pretty good thing to do, and that is add in duress codes to each message. Sometimes agents will include in each message a special code word which, if absent from the message, indicates that they are in trouble or that they are sending this message against their will. There have been a lot of cases where spies have gotten grabbed with their codebook, with their one-time pad, and they get forced at gunpoint to send a message to their handler for requesting like a physical meeting that can then be pounced on by their adversaries, right? So a lot of times you'll see people including specific code words in each message. Now the important thing to remember is to not put this duress code in the same spot every time. Uh, it would be preferred to switch this duress code out uh, periodically because once you start putting the same exact word in the same exact in the same exact place in each message, that starts developing a pattern, right? So again, if you're super hyper paranoid about your messages being intercepted, maybe move that message around somewhere. So put it at the beginning, put it at the end, work it into a sentence somewhere. Who knows? It's up to you. I just wanted to kind of point out that you can put in duress codes into each message. So in this particular message, you know, 056 Apple mission begins at dawn, travel to coordinates, you know, there's the coordinates. In this example, the code word is Apple. And there are two code words that the these agents have they are sending this message that have agreed upon. If the word is Apple in the message, that means everything's okay, right? And that means that this message is being sent freely and everything's everything's good to go. Now, if that word had been dream, in this case, the, uh, the, the example on the slide there, that would have meant that the agent sending the message has been compromised and that uh, the person receiving this message uh, can now go through their their procedures for for what to do with the compromise. Usually, to just destroy the one time pad book, destroy the code book, and move to uh, through the rest of their uh, compromise plan. Right. So this is a good way to make sure that you are actually communicating with the person that you're supposed to be communicating with, and at the same time, that person is not being forced to communicate with you to lure you into a trap. And finally, something random to consider as well, and that is font. Like I mentioned earlier, I switched things to the Courier New font for a very specific reason. Courier New is basically the modernized version of typewriter font. And typewriter fonts, uh, typefaces, uh, have been used, have been engineered very, very specifically over the years. And one of the very interesting attributes of this particular kind of font is that when you type numbers and even letters in, in a grid pattern, they stay in the grid pattern. So as we can see here, our one-time pad is perfectly square and it has nice, neat rows and columns of numbers. If I were to take that, that same exact text and convert it to impact, uh, the font that we're using for uh, other, other places around this, this uh, presentation, you can clearly see that it is just a jumble. It's, it's really hard on the eyes. It doesn't line up. It's, it's just not good, right? So when you're choosing the fonts to use for this kind of thing, if you're the kind of person who likes to type up uh, and print your uh, one-time pads from a secure computer and a non-networked printer, you might want to choose something like Courier New. That's the most common font that's used for this kind of thing because it's very, very efficient, very easy on the eye, and makes it very easy to find the key indicator to start decrypting or encrypting messages. 
So to wrap things up, let's talk about a couple of the disadvantages of one-time pads. Now these are not all the disadvantages, there are more, but really these are the big ones that get people into trouble, and they're, they're the reason for spies getting nabbed all over uh, the world and all throughout history. And really the first disadvantage is that if you make the tiniest mistake with your one-time pad, all of the benefits of this completely uncrackable system vanish. Remember, the one-time pad is mathematically, mathematically proven to be impossible to break. It doesn't matter how big your supercomputer is, it does not matter how 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 awesome your, your surveillance um, agencies are, it's uncrackable. Completely and totally, mathematically impossible to crack with the biggest of computers, right? However, if you make a mistake, or if you reuse your key, or if you let your key or your one-time pad be uh, intercepted, uh, or if you let your codebook be intercepted, well, then you, it can be cracked very, very easily. Your messages can be can be intercepted and cracked very easily. Not just not just the messages you sent you you sent like not just the last one you sent, but pretty much all of them, right? That are in that one time pad. So that's something to keep in mind, and that's how a lot of spies have gotten caught. They've reused their pads, they've cycled through and reused uh, their their one time pads, and that has been a huge downfall of many agents and clandestine and services uh, over history. And this directly is because of the next down downside, which is that it requires a finite source of one-time pads. You need to physically have a stack of papers which are your one-time pad. And those get used up every time you send a message. And at, and because they get used up, they have to be replaced. They have to be replenished. You have to get new one-time pads, you know, once a week or once a month from like a case officer. You know, that's how spies kind of do it. Uh, you, you have to meet face to face with someone and give them a new code book and give them a new stack of one time pads or you have to do it via dead drop or something like that. These present risks because if you get caught with a one time pad in your hand that's pretty much uh, the most damning evidence there is that you are in fact a spy or up to no good, right? So the spies that have been caught using a one-time pad, they were not caught because their one-time pad failed or because it was cracked, but because they made a mistake or they created a pattern. Reusing one-time pads is the number one uh, way that people can get caught. And as you can see from what I mentioned earlier, it's not as simple as someone being lazy and reusing their one-time pads because they're out of one-time pads and they haven't been able to make it to the dead drops. So they got to reuse one really quick to get an emergency message out. It's not as simple as that. You could simply miss a message and not be able to uh, understand that that message was, was sent and you could accidentally right over, basically, someone else's one-time pad, and therefore you've used it twice, and anyone listening can now crack it, right? Another big downfall for people has been to not destroy their one-time pads, not destroying their scrap paper, just writing it down on a little pocket notebook and sticking it in that in their pocket, and walking around because they forgot to destroy it. That has been a huge, huge reason for spies to get nabbed over the years. Another major reason for one-time pads being broken are not using truly random numbers, or using numbers generators that have been intercepted by a spy, a, a counterintelligence agency, right? So if you're using a software program to generate a one-time pad and there is a virus on that computer that you're using to do it, your one-time pad is useless. You, you have the most false sense of security there is, right? Because if somebody has your one-time pad, you're completely compromised, right? And these last two are not really related to the one-time pad at all, but really related to the human beings using it. And these are poor attempts to camouflage genuine messages and developing patterns over time. So to explain what I mean by this, let's take a look at the real-world example of what's called the Missing Nines. Back in 2007, amateur radio operators noticed a peculiarity with what are called the numbers stations, particularly the Atencion station. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with number stations, uh, rest assured we're going to be covering these specifically in due time, but number stations are shortwave radio stations that are historically, that have been historically used by spy agencies around the globe to send messages to their spies wherever they're at. Uh, using the one-time pad system. So quite literally, even to this day, you can get a shortwave radio and listen uh, on the allotted times at the uh, allotted frequencies, which are, of course, listed due to the uh, ham radio guys who've kind of cataloged these 
number stations. Uh, you can get a radio and listen in, and you will literally hear, uh, in a lot of cases, voice a voice comes over the radio, and they start reading out numbers, thus number stations, right? There's a very long history uh, with regards to this. There have been several documentaries made about number stations, many books written about them as well, and they're sort of a, a very fascinating part of the ham radio world, people listening to these uh, messages. But back in 2007, the ham radio community noticed something very, very interesting about one number station in particular, and that is is the Atencion station that people generally think comes from Cuba. Most people think that this is a number station that originates from probably the Radio Havana headquarters in Cuba, uh, and it is used, uh, and still to this day, used by Russian agents in the United States as a way of getting messages to those agents wherever they are in the continental United States. Obviously, shortwave radio can be used for global communications, but it's a little bit easier if your radio site is closer than, say, Moscow. Uh, to the United States, right? So the number station out of Cuba has been operating for, wow, many, many decades now. And in 2007, the ham radio operator community noticed that some of the transmissions that were originating from this station did not contain the number 9. And this is very interesting, and this is how this actually directly resulted in the arrest of at least 10 uh, Russian spies in the United States. So here's what was happening. The number station down in Cuba was doing exactly like I mentioned in the beginning. They were taking messages that were given to them, usually most likely encoded already, uh, and they were transmitting them over their shortwave radio to agents in the United States who were then decrypting these one uh, these messages using the one-time pad system. And there we go. It was a receive-only thing uh, for, for agents to get basically one-way orders from their spy handlers back in Russia. Well, here's the thing, though. They thought they were being a little bit clever, and what they would do is they would broadcast every hour on the hour, but some of these messages were completely fake. They were not they were not useful at all. Uh, they weren't in the one-time pad system. They they were just completely randomized numbers that, that the agents were creating that they thought would kind of fool anyone who might be listening. So, so you've got this analyst, right, listening here, listening in at Fort Meade or wherever they're at, and they're and they're picking up all of these transmissions, right? They they pick up all the ones here in purple on your screen, and even the genuine. Uh, transmission there in red. Well, the Russians, again, thought they were clever, and they were disguising the real genuine messages with the fake messages. So what they forgot, though, for whatever reason, either there was a bug or it was some kind of Stuxnet-type thing, there's really no indication as to why or how this happened, but it turns out that all of the fake messages, the messages that were just gibberish, had no meaning whatsoever, uh, the decoy messages never had the number 9 in them. And even the ham radio guys noticed this and were kind of confused as to why do a lot of these messages don't have the number 9 in them. Well, this was very, very useful in the arrest uh, of Russian spies on U.S. soil. So, there were a lot of messages without number 9s in them. Well, this was very, very handy because even though you, this might seem on the surface to be quite a, a, a very clever way of making it so that anyone listening into the conversation to, to these messages, which obviously any, anyone with a radio could listen in, either the NSA or you with a short word radio could hear these messages, right? If they were to put out all this fake traffic, that's a lot of effort for the cryptographers to go through to kind of work on this, right? But here's the thing. By leaving out the number nine, they kind of expose themselves to these messages being fake ones. And since U.S. agencies often work together with with, um, sort of, you know, counterintelligence taskings, right? There were agents that had under surveillance various Russians uh, in the United States who were some in New York, some in uh, Seattle, places like that. You can look them up uh, and kind of read about the history of uh, Operation Ghost Stories if you're looking uh, if you're looking for some uh, light reading. But in, at the end of the day, the interesting part is that the surveillance teams noticed that the people who they were surveilling were only home, only available to listen during the times where the genuine messages were being sent. A person who they were under surveillance for suspected of you know, being a Russian spy, they were only able to get to their radio when a fake message was being sent. Otherwise, they were either on the road or on, you know, flying somewhere or uh, at work or something when all of these other fake messages were sent. So basically, the Russians, even through their own efforts to kind of uh, camouflage their, their messages, they made it very, very clear as to which ones were genuine by a very simple mistake. So that's where we'll leave it today. 
So remember, no one is above making mistakes with this kind of system, even the Russian Federation, which arguably has been doing intelligence just as long as the United States has, and is equally as good at it. If a nation-state like Russia can make mistakes like this, so can you. So be careful, and make sure that you're taking the appropriate procedures to make sure that none of your codes are compromised, you never repeat a one-time pad, and all of the other security practices that are best for you. So hopefully this is a good introduction to the one-time pad system. We will be covering several other encryption methods in due time, but this is one of the easiest and simplest to understand because once you understand the one-time pad system, you can understand quite a lot of other encryption methods as well. So thank you for watching everyone, and thank you again to those of you who support us on Patreon and Utreon. You guys make it possible for us to bring this kind of educational content to everyone. So thank you again for that, and we will see you next time. And as always, fight in the shade.